Hello, everyone. I'll give everyone just a moment to kind of hop on. We are live for our second episode of Caring Counts Live. Through these lives, we are connecting people through memory care. And through these connections, we're hoping to find positive support um, through our struggles, through our successes. If we have connections, we have support. Our Caring Counts Live videos are brought to you by Applewood Our House. So I'm so excited today. Um, once again, my name is Taylor Hewlett. I work with Applewood Our House. I'm so super excited today to have um, Steve Jufalis and Dale Carter with me um, to share their stories and, and experiences and journeys through memory care. Dale, Steve, welcome. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. Good, good. Um, well, I would love to know a little bit more about you. So Dale, I would love to start out with you, um, your experience with memory care um, and your husband. Sure. Um, so my husband, Bill, and I met each other after college in Virginia in 1972. Uh, but we lived most of our married life in South Bend, Indiana, and that's where we raised our three children. Um, we both worked for the University of Notre Dame. I was in IT management, and he was a research engineer and worked until he retired at age 68. My first knowledge and experience with memory care came before I needed memory care for Bill. So I was caring for my mother in Maryland, um, just with elderly issues and cancer, uh, which started back in 2008. And as I guided us through all of her crises and transitions, I realized that families were struggling. And this is before I learned about dementia. Mm -hmm. um, so I put how I help my mom into a framework that I called ADAPT, and it kind of guided families in helping their loved ones through crisis and change. So I started speaking about this and sharing this, and I realized many of these families were impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia. So I thought, well, I need to get myself educated in this area, and that's what I set out to do. I learned a, a very important lesson early on that it's a specific approach we take that determines the quality of life with those de with dementia. Uh, we had to enter their world and embrace them where they were and try to empower them as much as we could in that space. Um, so I will fast forward to 2014. <laughs> My husband retired from Notre Dame. Um, I could see that he was slowing down. I thought it was normal aging. My mother, who was in her last year of cancer, pulled me aside and said, Dale, there's something very wrong with Bill and you need to do something about it. So I kind of took a step back and I observed him and I realized he had Lewy body dementia, which I knew what that meant for us. It was a sobering moment. Um, I got us a referral to Cleveland Clinic Brain Center and he was diagnosed with Lewy body um, September of 2014. He was still very with it enough to research the disease. And he put a little card by his nightstand. I will never forget this. And it he put on that card life expectancy five to seven years. Wow. And I could not remove that card. He knew it was there. Finally, I did, you know, a few years later. Um, so I do want to share, after that diagnosis, I, I decided three key things that I wanted for us moving forward in those final years. The first thing, I wanted to keep his life as normal as possible and help him engage in what he loved the most, because he was having Parkinson's at that point too, which really impeded him. I wanted to reconnect us with family and friends, not just for us, but for our family and friends. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to keep always looking for those supports and resources we needed as the disease progressed. 
So I will say we went the whole gamut of almost all the care you could possibly have for memory care, cared for him in home. I moved here, him to be closer to our children here, um, had some in-home care, adult day program. We had the therapies, physical, occupational speech. Um, and finally, he spent his last 18 months at Applewood in memory care. And, you know, looking back on it, um, there were some really difficult times, but I always felt we had great care and support there and that he had a good life. I love what you said about the empowerment. Um, I don't want to say keeping things normal because obviously a new normal is going to set in, but uh, the empowerment to your husband to keep doing some of the things that he likes to do and to keep that empowerment going and the positivity going. I think that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Dale. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve, um, I would love to know a little bit more about you and your experiences and kind of journey through memory care. Okay. Well, Carrie and I met back in Washington, D.C. when we were both in graduate school. Um, we actually lived on the same block. Uh, we lived briefly, but uh, uh, so she was in the, the healthcare administration program and I was in the business administration program. Um, we met, we went out. It was a great time. It was a lot of fun living in DuPont Circle and at the time. And the, late eighties, early nineties. Um, she, uh, she's, she worked for NIH as an administrative fellow. And then we had Hadley and she stayed at home with Hadley. And she also worked with her father who, who was a physician who had had a, heart, a couple of heart attacks, uh, uh, worked with him in a, a practice of treating type A behavior. So she, mm. she never really quite worked with me, but that she they kept trying. But, um, so, uh, we, uh, here in the D.C. area, various places uh, for quite a while and moved back to Denver uh, in 2000. Um, and I'm, I'm a Colorado native and Carrie always liked living in Colorado. So we came back and we had a great time. Uh, we, I kind of semi-retired and we traveled around all of the different national parks and areas that I'd never seen as a kid. <laughs> so we had, we had a good time. It was kind of Interesting is very fortunate that we did that because you always think of saving that for later and we did it then. So it was, it was good. And we spent a lot of time together um, and uh, I'll fast forward as well. Um, we, uh, um, uh, it's interesting because you, you never, hindsight you can see things, but while it's happening, you can't see things. Um, uh, it started probably about three to three to four years ago where she started saying, I can't, uh, I need my hearing checked because I can't understand you or you just mumble too much. And I mumble a lot, as you most of the people can probably tell. But, uh, <laughs> we had a friend who was an audiologist that checked her and said, no, her hearing's perfect. So I uh, didn't pick up on that. Um, and then later on, friends were over for uh, dinner and we started, I started to notice that she'd mentioned things about herself or her, like her mom or something like that to friends who knew, not necessarily knew her mom, but knew the story. Uh, her mom was Italian. That would be the title of my book. You know, my mom was Italian because she kept saying that. Every time. Mm. And, then, you know, you kind of start, um, you start compensating, you start guarding. So you, everywhere you go, you answer for her. And finally, one of our good friends said, there's something wrong with Carrie. And I said, I know. So we, you know, went to her primary care physician. She had some sort of idea of what it was. And nobody really had a good idea. She's she was only 62 at the time. So a lot of people went, well, it could be this, could be that. And uh, you know, a nurse practitioner that I knew that had been working with Carrie later on said, you know, you never really know sometimes. You know, they originally thought it was Louis body, but she was fine with balance and things like that. Um, so the final, finally, we've kind of arrived at, at uh, uh, frontal temporal dementia and it makes perfect sense because it's very quick and, and, and her behaviors are match that perfectly. So we're kind of fresh in because we haven't actually haven't been in Applewood for a year yet. Uh, July 9th would be our, when she needed care, uh, it was a point at which, uh, so, uh, we, she wound up in the hospital room at uh, the hospital and they said, you know, you can't take care of her anymore. And before that, as Dale said, I was 24 seven. 
and you don't realize how much you're really killing yourself a lot of times by doing that. As, as soon as that that weight was lifted, you realize how much you've been doing or how much care you you how much worry you had had. So um, she's there, great. I mean, great staff. You know, like I think I've told you guys, we're we're riding a terrible train, but we're riding it first class because the the house is wonderful, the care is wonderful, and I know she's happy. Thank you for that. Th thank you. I wanted to point out two kind of similarities that I saw between um, when you both were talking around the person and Dale. I think it was your mother that pulled mm -hmm. you aside. Um, and then Steve, the doctor that maybe pulled you aside or, um, Oh, no, it's a friend of ours, yeah. a friend of yours that pulled you aside and, and kind of said, and, and maybe you knew, maybe you didn't, but said it's, this is something a little bit bigger. Yeah. I, I think there's an element of denial. It's like anything, both, both Carrie and I are cancer survivors as well. And it's good for you. When, when, uh, like 26 years ago, you know, my daughter's 28 yesterday. So, um, um, I had, I had a leukemia, a form of leukemia and I was in great shape. I was running, I run marathons and everything else, but I'd always had these night sweats and you never think about it when you're in your thirties and mm -hmm. that kind of thing where you just kind of inure yourself to what the situation is and don't really, you know, face it head on. And then, and then, uh, later on Carrie had breast cancer and it was one of those things where we had both had experience being the caretaker. So it's almost like we practiced it once before. She was much better at it than I was. So don't sell yourself short, but <laughs> the adversity that you both faced is uh, inspiring. And the strength that you have now is, is, is inspiring both of you. Dale, I wanted to ask you and Steve, I think you're part of this as well. Um, the Care Cafe through Applewood mm -hmm. um, that you started. Tell me more about what it is and, and how it got started. Yeah, so... I approached Applewood and asked if I could start this care cafe and it's really a support group for family members. Um, I knew early on when I first started caring for Bill that caring for a spouse with a terminal disease was far different than when I cared for my mom with cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it really, Steve, you understand, it impacts your life, your world everything about you will never be the same again. Yeah. And I knew experts tell us we have to care for ourselves. So I knew I had to find a support group in South Bend. I tried several and I was so disappointed. They'd be places where people would come and vent. Sometimes I couldn't even speak. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't feel like it was a warm, welcoming environment, but I knew I needed a support group um, because this is a marathon, not a sprint. That's what we tell people. This, this disease can go on for years. Um, so when I got to Denver, someone invited me to a support group. It was totally different. I felt like it was a safe place. I felt like I wanted to come back to it. You shared, you were heard. And I realized it was a facilitator that made all the difference. She set the foundation, the tone and guided us. That group kind of dispersed. And once I got Bill to Applewood, I would talk to other family members when I was visiting him, but I never had time to really talk to them. And mm -hmm. that's why I approached Applewood and I said, can I start a care cafe? And I think it's a, a more welcoming name than calling it a caregiver support group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it just seems fun. friendlier. Um, yeah, so I started that 14 months ago when we had to go online because of COVID. We do it mm -hmm. via Zoom. It's actually become a closer knit group and people want to keep doing it via Zoom. Um, it's an amazing group. Steve can talk a little bit about his what he gets from it, but we have about 10 to 12 people and a new person almost always comes on each month and they are embraced. I really appreciate that. Um, we, because we have 10 to 12 people, we have people with experience throughout all the stages and different dimensions. So mm -hmm. no matter what question or concern comes up, there's always somebody that's like been through it and they share their insight. And I just, I'm, I'm really proud of the group and, and what we do together each month. 
Yeah, and that group is open to anyone, not mm-hmm. just families from Applewood, that anyone kind of experiencing something like this uh, through memory care. Um, it's a great resource. And I think that's kind of going into our goal with these live videos too, um, is to really share stories and, and find support, which is good. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Christine. She said, thank you for sharing your stories. Very heartfelt and inspiring. Um, Christine, thanks for being here. Super excited you're watching. If you have anyone that you wanna share this with, we're happy to, that would be absolutely great. Um, Steve, Dale had mentioned that you're part of the Care Cafe. I was curious on how that has, a um, what your experience has been like with the Care Cafe. Um, you know, the, the one thing I really like about the Care Cafe, it's a very um, family oriented. You know, it's not a, you know, there's a structure to it and everything else. There is a structure and Dale's very good about outlining what you know, the ground rules are before we start. But it's, you know, a lot of the families already from visiting now, you know, now that we can't, but you know, them. so you already have a somewhat of a rapport, but it's nice to be able to talk, you know, and just vent, so, not vent, not, it's not a question of venting. I think a lot of times it's when you, you just need to say it, I guess. You know, say what you're feeling. Yeah, being able to talk about it is helpful. Yeah, although the Care Cafe, there's no latte served, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe in the future. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so I wanted to ask the question around Steve. You had said hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You, you kind of knowing what you know now, you wish you knew then, of course. When you were first experiencing this, did you have a moment with your wife that you were like, "That, that's something bigger"? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there there were many, I think, smaller moments, but a lot of there's a mo- moments with hers. It's been fast. I mean, just amazingly fast. Um, I think all told, about three years. When most Alzheimer's uh, mm-hmm. dementia is probably maybe 10 years sometimes, maybe even right. more. Um, and she's young. I mean, she's 62. So mm-hmm. you, I think a lot of the planning that you think that you do as you get older, I wish I would have done sooner. You know, yeah. you never expect it to be that. And then all of a sudden it's upon you. So you really can't shift gears or, but you know, everybody, everybody around has always been very accommodating. They find a way to work through things and everything else. So that's, that's, oh, I have a bulldog. That's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, she just saw somebody walk down the sidewalk. So, no, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think that's what part of it is. I think I, I tended to push it away and try to solve problems day to day as opposed to going, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that everything's, you know, whatever it is, insurance, whatever is taken care of. Because you you're really kind of in denial in the beginning, and that's and it, it, the denial was you know she's 62 this can't be all time you know? and she's she was brilliant you know it's like you know she read every day crosswords word word game themed I mean everything you know everything they say to do to push off Alzheimer's she did that that was her that was her lifestyle she just read 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 and it was like one of these things where I go. Well, it can't be that. It might be something like a tumor or something like that. We, it, you know, all of a sudden, when you, when you know what it is, it's like, okay, you're in the middle of it. You know, I would yeah, plan ahead a little bit. Yeah, what I'm hearing you say is kind of two, two things. Having wished you started planning a little bit earlier and had the conversation and started the conversation a little bit earlier. And how do you know what you don't know? So, right. but then on the flip side of that is exactly that. Allowing yourself the time, the whatever you need to start planning for all of the steps that are now coming down the pipe. Yeah, you know, and, and, that, and take help when people offer it. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are good resources and you, you I, I solve problems. That's what I've always done professionally, everything else. And so it's like, I can fix this. And yeah. you realize that there are a lot of people out there that want to help. So let's, can I dive into that for a second? When you started looking for people that are help or people started offering, where did they come from? How did you find them? Oh, well, see, most of them were situational. I mean, when I, we wound up in Lutheran's emergency room and, you know, Carrie had had a, a urinary tract infection and which had just set her off. It was, 
pretty tough. And the social worker there and this lady that kind of helps guide people around said, there's a great place for her. You know, you can't, you can't have her at home anymore. You know, what if she does something to you and then wanders off and you, you think about that and it's terrible. But uh, she, uh, you know, she mentioned Applewood. She goes, but she's too young to go to Applewood right now. She was 61 at the time. And mm -hmm. so we went to another place, which was very nice, but it wasn't quite what I, we were looking for. I, I had toured Applewood, you know, and, and I thought this is, you know, perfect. And then, uh, so that a lot of those decisions, not decisions, but a lot of the help just came, showed up because of the situation. And then while I was there, I talked to some other people who are involved in the, in the, in the profession and they start, you know, saying, well, here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. And, and, you know, for me, I, I, it, it's been so fast that I didn't have like a chance to go, okay, I'm going to research my path and have a project plan for all, you know, this kind of thing. Because it's just, I mean, literally a year ago, we were sitting on our porch, you know? Wow. Yeah. 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 Okay. Dale, I wanted to pose the same question to you. What you talked about all the different types of care and the journey of, of care, if you will, that you went through with your husband. Um, you talked about the different therapies and then different assisted livings and things like that from, from that. Where did you find some resources, some support? So my story is a little bit different. About six months before I moved Bill and me to Denver, my sons and I had a heart to heart talk and they said, you can't keep caring for him alone. And I truly mm -hmm. was alone in South Bend. I knew all the resources, but I was alone and I knew that was not the place for him to, live out his life. So I moved us here in October of 2017. I knew one person. I knew my son. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of unknowns. I started just one person at a time connecting. I would connect with one person and they'd say, here are the people you connect with. And that's how I eventually found my way to Applewood. By the time I found Applewood, it was before he needed care. We had a little bit of time. He was in an adult day program, but we were getting real close to where I could no longer care for him. Mm -hmm. I found Applewood. I asked them all my questions. My final question was, how do you train your staff? And they said, by Tipa Snow. And I said, this is the place for him because they met all the other criteria. And when I heard that, I'm like, this is it. And I really do believe that's a difference in the quality of care there. The I wanted to touch on that for a second. The TIPA Snow method that Dale's talking about is a positive care approach. And, and we're super excited that we have that implemented in our buildings and our communities. Um, we are actually super excited too. Um, end of July, I think July 29th, we're having TIPA Snow on a Facebook Live. Um, here. So please tune in for that. We're super excited for that. Um, she is an expert in this field. So anyhow, coming back to the resources and everything like that, what I would like to touch on for both of you would be when you start looking for care, when you start trying to find resources, some of them make themselves known. And if you find a resource that maybe isn't quite right for you, that person is going to try to point you in the direction that you that they think you need to go or give you some options in the direction that you might need to go. Is that true or am I a little bit off base? Uh, I, yeah, go ahead, Steve, you go first. Well, I, yeah, no, that's what I found. I think most of, most of my experience has been about, I'm mean, basically floating down a river. You know, you get in one rapid and you, it leads you to something else. And and everybody that we dealt with, even at the other play, facility that we went to, we were very caring when they said, yeah, you're moving, that's great. You know, they worked with me and, and you know, they're just, you always have circumstances and people really do want to help. You know, even if it's, even if it's, you know, moving to another facility or even if it's, you know, something that, you know, a lot of people get their, you know, professional ego involved. And I have not seen that at all in this field. It, you know, where mm -hmm. people just say, yeah, yeah, this makes more sense for her doing this as opposed to staying here or doing, doing this. So I think, I think for the most part, most resources, if you run into a resource, 
they're going to lead you to somewhere or they might be able to one that you're looking for too. So I think it's mostly, mostly it's an experience of listening and actually holding the, your loved one in, in that space and saying, yeah, this would make good sense for her because you're making all the decisions for her. Right. And, and most nearly and now all of those people have their, their best interest in a, at a, as well. But you really kind of wait and just, I mean, I just assess. I mean, it's a quick, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, roadmap for this. I mean, it's like right. you a situation and you make a decision and then move Everyone's on. different. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would say that's very true. That was true for me at each stage of where Bill was like in his adult daycare, I had a core person there who I truly trusted and had expertise. She could guide me to the next stage. His neurologist at UC Health guided me to their palliative care, who then guided me to hospice. So it's like, you know, it's almost like stepping stones. Mm -hmm. And yeah, these these people, this is such a, a an area where people want to help. These these professionals are helpers. And and Steve, you did this, you did this very intuitively, like any spouse would. You know your loved one's needs, wishes, and values. There are so many options out there that it's mind boggling. So you have to find these key resources that will guide you along. And then you say whether it matches your loved one's needs, wishes, and values. Right. Yeah, you 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 mentioned the point that this is a marathon. I think in my case, it was more like a middle distance run, maybe a steeplechase, because yeah. I think, I mean, the decisions that that Dale had to make over time, I probably have had to make over over months. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's a little bit different, but that it's. I mean, I had nothing to do but be intuitive because it was. Mm -hmm. Thing came up. Next thing came up. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll I'll say it again at the risk of being repetitive. Uh, your strength, both of you, is inspiring. For those. Um, so I'll end our Facebook Live with uh, with this last question. What do you want our listeners, our viewers to to learn from your experience? And Steve, let's start with you. Uh, like I said, it's a terrible train, but you're right. Try to find a first class ticket. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's the key. The key is to find something that I think the, be the best of a bad circumstance. So that's what you're always looking for is, is comfort, care, you know, and something that you can always, that's, that's your backstop, you know, at least they're comfortable and they're being cared for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's been the best part of your experience? Well, I mean, Applewood's probably been the best one. I mean, that's not a commercial or anything like that, but no, because, no, thank you. <laughs> no I mean, it, you, you walk in, you know, the, the whole setup is around caring. The whole, actually, the building is built around that. So you know that, you know, it's a comfortable space. You know, she has her buddies. You know, Dottie's there. They're, yeah, yeah. They're, you know, you you know when, especially when we were visiting. I, you know, we've visited every day almost, and uh, you know, you get to know everybody. You know, and so you know everybody else's family, and then you. So that's one of the biggest things that is that you. You find a community for them, a place where they, where you're comfortable, that they're comfortable. How's that? If we if we remove Applewood from that, when you're looking for a placement or care for your loved one, finding somewhere that has care centered and that everything revolves around their comfort and their care. Right. Exactly. The focus is the focus is on them. I mean, they're and not everybody has that circumstance where they can pick and choose, and and that's that. The point is that you probably try to find some advocate within these facilities that say, okay, I know this person cares about them. You know, that mm -hmm. look out for them. Because you've been 24-7, right? But you can't be 24-7 when they're in the facility. You know, you can't right. move in and do that. So I think that's, I mean, you have to be single-minded about that. You say, are, is, are they safe? Are they cared for? Are they happy? You know, yeah. you're not always going to make them happy. But as long as they're cared for, you know, at least – that's, you know, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Steve. And, and Dale, same question to you. What would you like our viewers, listeners to take away from your experience? Yeah, so I want to really speak to the family members out there. 
Um, and many of you may not identify with the term family caregiver, but if you are that person who is that connection to a loved one with dementia, know that you need to care for yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's a long journey and we are so focused on doing what's right for our loved one, but man, we've got to take care of ourselves. And I'm talking physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. Um, that is so key. And if I could say one thing that I will never forget about Applewood, it was the, the day that Bill passed and I came out of his room and I was getting ready to leave. And I realized that the nurse manager and the two CNAs that were there the day he passed were there the first day he arrived. Mm -hmm. And I just thought to myself, I thought, I never, I never would have envisioned that could ever happen with a kind of turnover rate yeah. in memory care. And, mm -hmm. and I can't promise that for everybody at Applewood, right. but that's such a memory for me as I left his room that day. Thank you, Dale. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Steve. Thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing your stories. Um, like I said at the beginning, our Caring Counts episodes, if you will, podcast or otherwise, um, is meant to connect people. Connect people walking kind of a similar journey, whether it's a marathon, a mid-level run. I can't remember, Steve, what you called it, but... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But it's, yeah, we're here to connect and, and find support and, and hopefully find some positivity. Um, the terrible train, but you're riding first class. Thank you both for being here. Thanks everyone for, for uh, tuning in with us today. If you have any comments, please post them below. We can pass those along to Steve and Dale if you would like. And we will see you for our next Caring Counts Live, I believe in two Wednesdays. Thanks everyone. Thank you.